Soldering skills are marginal, um, but luckily Natalie, who you see there encapsulated by one of our um, uh, installations, is both patient and has a kind of a, a level of skill and craft that I don't possess. Um, and so she's truly a kind of a, a digital sort of knitter um, and a kind of, um, uh, let's say an antagonist at some points, but definitely a, a true collaborator. Um, and so I'm gonna just sort of talk a little bit about, about what's on our mind right now um, as designers. We've recently, um, um, a year and, and three quarters ago, had a daughter, her name is Stella. Um, we brought her into the world and we're obsessed with teaching Stella about the world. Uh, and we're really convinced that we can influence her. Um, I hate to use the word train because I think I've realized that that doesn't, we're not training her at all, right? We are guiding her. Um, and I think I've learned actually more in this process um, of, of kind of just being a father and actually learning things about or gaining a different intuition, let's just say, about the future that I probably didn't possess or think that deeply about. Um, the idea of a, of a one and a half year old um, picking up an iPad, being able to navigate it fluidly, first of all, just to turn it on, actually be able to type in a password, navigate fluidly, open up a, open up a, a game, and be able to, you know, um, have a kind of a customized, uh, customized skins, etc. One and a half is absolutely extraordinary, uh, and mind-boggling, and disturbing, and fascinating, right? But, but what I found really intriguing about this is the idea that um, her expectations of the physical world are tightly coupled with the digital realm at this point. Um, I have actually seen her. Um, take the iPad, put it down, and walk over. We put, a, we put a, a wall decal kind of wallpaper thing in her room of a monkey hanging off of a palm tree kind of thing, and she literally is walking over to this and taking her hand and swiping her hand <laughs> across the wall. And she is doing that with everything, her clothing, everything that she's wearing. Um, she's doing it with yucky things like mud. She's doing it with, you know, kind of everything. So f I think what's really intriguing about the next generation, let's say the DRL in, in 20 years, is what's going to what, what's going to happen when when someone like you know Stella and her and her colleagues, her friends, her her um, her band, um, come through a school like this, and what are going to be the expectations of of, of 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 space, of form, of architecture. Um, Etc. And then you and then you and then you get these other threads of things happening. The the amplification, let's say, of 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 media onto the city, onto the urban realm. The idea that you know one might play Tetris on a on a skyscraper. A skyscraper now becomes a kind of active and interactive kind of realm. For me, is just absolutely fascinating. And somewhere in between these things, um, I think the 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 conversations that we're having are much more about trying to situate the work um, in a world where, where this becomes commonplace. Things that we talk about, and we heard every one of these words probably today, um, and no one's really clear about what they mean. That's what I love about critics, um, students, saying these words with, with kind of authoritative precision, as if they really get them and understand them and possess them. But I would actually argue that these words are, you know, I mean, everyone has seen this. These words are, are, are up in the air right now. It's contestable what it might mean to be, to be natural. This is Golden Gate Park in, in San Francisco. Everyone thinks it's this, you know, virgin territory with bison and, and redwood trees. The fact is it used to be a dunescape. The, the bison were imported from the Midwest. Uh, but everyone goes there to, to sort of get this sense of, 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 of the kind of the wild, right? Um, the physical, as we saw today in many of the projects, is, is something that's, that's, that's unclear what the boundaries of, of the physical are. And certainly, and I, and I apologize if there's young people here, um, I didn't realize it was your, um, your day of recruitment, um, but I think um, you know, we're, we're, we're moving into a world where there's gonna be very strange juxtapositions, and a and good friend of mine is, on the Google Glass team, and I gave a lecture at Google X about three months ago, and I showed this this slide, and they they oh my god they were they were really disturbed that this is what's actually happening. But I think that the, the strange juxtaposition, the overlay of the digital onto the primal, the physical primal world of of something like this, 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll go to the next slide. Um, which is, you know, it's equally as disturbing, um, the Sam Jinx work. Um, but I love that there's this kind of like strange world. And of course the, the digital retina sort of project, you know, we're looking at a, a, a you know, very attractive person, but she's a cyborg, you know, she is actually interlaced with, with a kind of machine. Like one of the modules we saw today, you know, it's been embedded in, in, a, in a kind of a human, right? And so we're actually entering into this world where these distinctions really don't have a, have a clear um, kind of status. Um, and what I loved today was, was, the, was the work really, I think, drew that out and, and um, kind of was compelling. I'm gonna show a bunch of projects. It's gonna be a bit of a rapid fire. Um, I'll show a bunch of different things that we're actually doing. And I thought I would actually start with, with some super early work. Um, so Natalie, my partner and I, we're very much like you guys. Um, when we graduated from, from, from school, we thought, you know, what the, what the hell are we gonna do with all this knowledge? You know, what are we gonna do with all this, these fantasies about the world? And we began to kind of collaborate. And um, we, were, we were at this point doing many competitions. This is back in 2002. So many years ago, doing big competitions, this section cut through a proposal for a, an urban space in, in, in Seoul. Um, but we really, believed in um, our ideas and embedded every one of them in every project. So, um, you know, and I, I hate to admit that, that to the students today because much of my criticism today was that you were all just embedding too much in your project and you should sort of withhold and, and have some self-control. The reality is that myself at your age had absolutely no control. Um, and, I, and I think it's actually highly productive at, at this age to do it. Um, another thing that we did is a, a, a proposal for the, the Trump World Tower, very serious proposal for, for some um, housing, for some apartments. Um, but we were, we were um, nauseated by the project, say. And so what we did is we did this. We did a project, um, again, this is like our, literally our second collaboration together, uh, where we actually sat down and figured out a way to collaborate through the drawing of this really, really large sectional drawing. It's about a 12 foot um, long drawing where I was embedding ideas, Natalie was embedding ideas and we were kind of cross linking them say. And so what we started to do is figure out a way to kind of draw out ideas. Um, and really I think at this early stage we're setting an agenda, setting a set of impossible things that did not exist. It wasn't clear really how this would be built. Um, it wasn't really clear what its social agenda was. We were just sort of fascinated both with nature and uh, technology and the kind of interplay of these things. We started drawing these out, thinking about interface, thinking about, about surfaces that were sort of, again, kind of pulsating with, with digital media, thinking about these kind of hanging bags that were kinetic and were constantly kind of in motion um, and beginning to kind of think about what kind of world that would be. How would we begin to communicate these ideas um, how would we sort of begin to engineer this world? Um, and so a lot of this is just highly speculative. I mean, honestly, I think at this point, um, I didn't have any idea what many of these words were. We were just grabbing them, let's say, and kind of putting them on drawings. Um, and, you know, what I think is really kind of funny about this period is that even that, that whole idea has been, this is a project that we're working on right now with a $10,000 budget and, and two hard body suitcases having to show up at South by Southwest um, with $10,000 budget and make a, make a kind of a pavilion. Um, so essentially these are, these are, it's a kind of carryover from a project we did 14 years ago. And these are um, stepper motor actually driven ribbons that move in space um, with some stage lighting above to make a kind of a temporary space. This is a project that we did so long ago that we just sort of returned to. Um, these are just sort of frames, experiments that we did during this period, early um, kind of 2002, 2003, started to build um, some of these pieces. These are sort of a, a kind of a lattice frame that we began to embed with kind of sensors um, and other kinds of technologies called cathode tubes and really trying to assemble a kind of a synthetic, um, um, a, a kind of a, a assembly, um, not really precisely knowing what its capacity w was. It was really a study, build something, um, observe how people uh, perform in the space, observe how people um, interact with it, observe how they might want to get into it and really kind of study it. And I would actually say that for me, that's been one of the most valuable things is to be unabashedly, say, experimental at a certain phase, 
um, committed to trying to build something that's at the scale of a, of a human body, put it in a gallery, um, um, you know, blow a lot of cash on building stuff early on because it's going to be worth it, um, and, and it's it's it was super satisfying. Other moments where we started to conflate these worlds, we started to build architectural models off of things like um, uh, LED displays, embedding things like um, shape memory alloy into small trusses. Um, this is a this is a model that's surrounded by infrared sensors. It had an interface that would update in real time as you moved around the model and would actually begin to kind of move these trusses. And again, we didn't really know where this would lead, but we were very interested in this idea of a live model. We had built static models for so long, we were interested in this idea of a kind of live modeling process um, by which a model would begin to be updating itself in real time and had kind of performative capacities um, embedded within it. And again, just sort of like the, the kind of knitting of, of models um, again, the, the, a lot of the work that you're going to see, we sort of have still notions of, of, of kind of, um, um, of kind of assembly. Um, all the pieces you'll see um, in the next um, half hour or so, we make literally everything. Um, we hand stitch it. We do all of our own electronics, all of our own wiring. We're sort of super interested in this. This is a highly, this is an installation piece at the Van Allen Institute called the Aurora Project. And again, a kind of an experiment with edge detecting, uh, edge detector um, sensors, proximity sensors, that kind of um, created this kind of cascading effects through this um, kind of synthetic assembly. Um, and the sort of interest in beginning to like look at how we might begin to use things like LEDs. These are cold cathode tubes that would respond to people's proximity of the piece. Um, the, literally the electrons would kind of move up into the sky. Um, and, and, and this kind of thing. I mean, really trying to assemble and study and, and kind of observe how people would, would work with it. Um, other pieces, this is called the Zeromax um, envelope. It's a, it's a second skin, a kind of kinetic robotic skin um, for a building. Um, and really what I love about this project is it, it was a project that was a very serious project um, that was all about building skins. Um, we built the project. It was actually supposed to be mounted on a, on a kind of a wall and we, we mounted it on a wall. And again, we were, no, we were like nauseated by that, by the wall. We, we, actually, um, we actually realized what we had done was actually greater than, than, the, than the original idea. And so we suspended it um, literally from kind of cables. There's this kind of, almost a kind of a, a, kind of a, a vein-like kind of a nervous system that's actually literally kind of suspending these little kinetic pieces. And we're just using infrared sensors and these things would just really simply kind of open and close as you, as you kind of uh, move to it. In fact, the idea was that it would actually close itself down. So the closer you got to the surface, the more kind of in, impenetrable it, it got. And again, a kind of a total experiment of suspending this piece, um, the obsession with lots of detailing. There's no glue in here. We're actually notching and kind of putting everything together. It's all hand sewn, like a big kind of wearable um, kind of textile. Um, but we really wanted people to move up to the piece, to actually look deeply at the piece. And that's why the detail was so important to us. There's certain degrees of kind of porosity um, that you can begin to see. You can see through certain parts, other parts act like shields. Um, and these are just, again, kind of early, early pieces. Um, this is a, a project that we did um, for, a, for a gallery. It was a, it was a show that was interested in looking at um, issues of, of kind of um, strange weather, strange climate, climate change. Why, you know, how, how do we get people to viscerally understand that the planet is sort of changing? Um, and this was our kind of take on it. Um, this is called the Glaciarium. And so what we did in, the, in this gallery is we encapsulated a, a cylinder um, of ice. So there's literally a, a piece of ice that the, the poor gallery assistant, literally, we had a, we had a, a freezer uh, like the guys yesterday. We had, a, we had the gallery buy this big freezer. We would drop this cylinder of ice in the middle of the glaciarium every day. Um, and the idea was that the more you actually looked in at this piece of melting ice, the more the ice itself would melt. So in many ways, what was happening is that we were trying to implicate people. The, the very act of observing um, the, the ice core, you actually participated in its, in its kind of degradation. So what happened is there was a series of sensors um, around it that would trigger a heat lamp above it, and you would actually accelerate it. So you'd look through, you'd actually see the water kind of melting across it. Um, and then we, we rigged this up with some contact mics. So you can see a little, the basin at the bottom water would drop and would hit a contact mic and was amplified through the gallery. 
So again, the poor gallery had to listen for, for five months or six months to the sound of, of dripping ice hitting a contact mic. Um, but it would be accelerated as, as people would begin to kind of look through it. So here's the ice core being dropped in. And then here's the, the piece being kind of observed. The idea was to make a kind of interior environment that was like highly, um, almost fetishized. Um, this is what, what it would look like when you were actually looking into the Glacierium, this kind of crystalline environment. Um, we got really excited when we started to learn about how to kind of freeze the ice to make the ice itself a kind of compelling object. And that what was involved with that was literally taking the, the freezer and actually loosening one of the wheels so that the freezer would vibrate. And it would actually create this kind of helical crystalline structure. Um, and that became a kind of inspiration. So the kind of inside and uh, the inside environment was highly kind of um, 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 kind of had a, had a kind of really interesting relationship. Um, and this is really what we were after is we were after getting people to have a kind of interface with this kind of machine, um, get them to, to kind of look through it, understand that they were affecting it, look at the kind of melted ice in, in, the, in the kind of the core in the, in, the, in the bottom and really start to understand the kind of their effect that they were beginning to have on this kind of system. Um, other, other pieces that we're, we're doing, we're doing a lot of furniture prototyping um, right now for various projects, including the Athens project that Theo mentioned, um, and looking at, at that kind of, um, again, that direct kind of feedback between a human, human being and, and a, kind of a, a kind of a surface. And so these are very simple prototypes for a kind of reactive surface that might begin to kind of register and have a kind of memory, let's say, of, of, of kind of human um, occupation. Um, and then other interests which are very much tied to what I'd say would be certain uh, previous agendas of the DRL in, in kind of registering dynamic flows. This is a project uh, for Union Square in New York. Um, if anyone has actually sat in Union Square during the day, maybe eating lunch, you'll know that the ground in Union Square, every time the train comes through, like literally is vibrating, which I always found to be really this beautiful moment where you're sitting in an urban environment um, and you're actually able to sense um, something that's happening, you know, 30 or 40 feet below you. Um, and, and so, and not everyone really understood that or felt that. And so how did, how could we actually make that um, super legible? This is just a kind of a, a quick diagram of that train is coming through. Um, and so we actually began to kind of prototype this idea um, of, of, this, of this kind of, um, kind of vertical um, marker that would begin to literally create space and begin to kind of register the, the vibration or the kind of urban um, flow below it. Um, and we started to make these kind of encampments that were sort of um, super sensory encampments that would actually begin to encourage people to kind of sit and really begin to kind of feel deeply what was kind of happening around them. And this is the sort of a bigger vision of how this would begin to work. So, you'd be, you know, you could be across the park and actually begin to see these kind of flickers like fireflies or something moving across the landscape and have some sense of what was happening at a, at a different kind of layer, um, let's say, in, in the city. Uh, a project that, that we just did um, this summer for the Venice Biennale, we were invited by the Swiss Pavilion to do a, a project, um, and this was something that I've been developing for a while, um, called the Data Sprayer. And one of the, one of the things that we're sort of tasked with at Future Cities Lab is, is looking at data, making data um, tangible and visceral, um, and, and really questioning why so much of, of, of data that's collected in cities happens to be you know, locked in your, in your iPhone or on your computer. So data sprayer is an attempt to actually take that information um, and actually have robotic autonomous elements in the city that would begin to go out and, and begin to mark the city. So for the Venice Biennale, we, we um, became very interested in the, the, obviously the, the flood maps, um, things that we could begin to reveal in Venice. So we sort of, um, this is a kind of pixelated version of the flood map. We decided to kind of do a kind of demarcation. So literally drawing and spraying the flood map back on the city. We're using a mission planner software, which a lot of you guys are using from, from 3D Robotics Group. But basically this allows us to, to um, we're controlling all of our robots directly out of Grasshopper and Firefly. And then we're feeding those waypoints directly into this kind of mission planner. Um, and then we're drawing these, we've got this kind of literally a, a kind of a rover um, mechanism that is literally spray painting these uh, dashed lines. So superimposing literally notational systems that we might have on maps, right, or on phones or in digital interfaces like Google and spray painting them back out on the city. So you can imagine an entire kind of network of these things um, out there um, doing work. Um, other applications for this, we've, we've been approached by a group that 
um, is, is doing these amazing maps in San Francisco of bicycle accidents. So there's a, there's a very, you know, certain, certain areas of the city have disproportionate amounts of, of bicycle accidents. So the idea would be that this can actually grab and harvest data about bicycle accidents and literally go out. You can just release it at the end of the block. It's just using GPS. Um, and then basically it would go out and spray paint, you know, the symbol of a person kind of splatted on the ground or whatever. So you'd be riding your bike and you would actually literally know um, that there was a kind of a dangerous location there. Um, but so much of this uh, stuff is sort of locked in our phones. Why is it that we, we, we um, can't have this kind of data sort of superimposed on the city? Um, other pieces that we're doing, most of these are, are um, for shows, um, uh, various exhibitions that we're doing. Um, this is called the Augerbot. It's a robot that I developed that basically, um, you, it's connected to um, a, a basically a, a kind of a GPS wayfinding system. Um, it's called the Augerbot. It's basically a hole drilling robot. It goes out and it's looking for water in extreme environments. Um, and and it, it begins to kind of demarcate its environment. Obviously, it's a kind of a known body type. It's a hexapod robot. Um, but a part of this, what, what I think has actually been a lot of uh, fun, is um, building these, these sort of things, 3D printing them, um, constructing them, and then beginning to use them to kind of speculate on, on ways that we might have a kind of human computer um, kind of interface. Um, and so I'm also uh, co-developing a software um, um, called Firefly, which is a, essentially a plugin for Grasshopper. And we're really looking really deeply, I'd say, at a lot of the issues that we're, you guys are talking about, incorporating machine vision tools, um, et cetera. And we're, we're trying to understand this. And this, this project is a kind of experiment in, in how to, to kind of do that. Um, and so what you're going to see here is basically um, someone controlling this physical robot through gesture. Um, so the, the, the robot is in a way mimicking the human. And a lot of my questions today to the students were like, what is the robot actually understanding? What language is it, is it um, understanding? So right now this is Hugo, and his gestures are, are literally controlling this robot. He might be right now gesturing the robot to actually approach him. Um, this is another person in the lab who's, who's just walking, and the robot is actually simulating the walking um, by. We're using a connect. It's kind of a hacked connect, connect module. Um, and this is another aspect that we're actually super interested in is getting direct um, feedback. So let's say something um, you know, you know, unexpected began to happen to the robot. You'd actually want to know what was happening. So we're beginning to embed, embed um, kind of sensors directly in our robots. You can actually pick them up and manipulate them. And a 3D model in, in Grasshopper in real time is beginning to kind of update um, in real time. And so these are just sort of um, 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 kind of uh, experiments that we're doing that I think begin to kind of have an effect, let's say, on some of the other work. Um, this is a, a piece that we just did for a show. It's called The Theater of Lost Species. Um, and we're, we're being prompted by uh, many people right now to do um, conceptual pieces that are about kind of climate change um, or, or species extinction. And this is, a, um, this is essentially a robot that is going out. It's cataloging its physical environment. Um, and then, and then it's, it's basically a massive database of extinct or near extinct species. So it's cataloging this, these, these pieces. And then people can begin to go look into this kind of theater of lost species and see these um, literally kind of scans of, of species that the, that, the, that the robot has gone out to do. Again, a kind of conceptual piece, um, but a kind of a prompting. This is a, um, I call this our, our, our um, uh, you know, we're trying, to, we're trying to raise money to actually build a larger prototype. This is our sort of our museum model, which we're trying to convince people to begin to, to sort of do this. It turns out it's actually really complex. Um, um, making databases of, 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 of living things um, turns out to be a big project, actually, much bigger than I thought. Um, and there's some folks out there that are, are super interested in this notion of making a kind of a catalog of all living um, or, or near extinct or extinct creatures, uh, making some kind of um, digital model of that as a kind of record. Um, so I'm gonna jump in and talk a little bit about sort of three projects um, uh, that, are, that are kind of a trilogy. Um, we've, we've done these three projects primarily because we, when we first moved to San Francisco, we wanted to really take on the city and take on the, the kind of the Bay Area in general. Um, this is actually, our office is maybe a block away from here. And in the mornings, um, you know, the Bay Area, San Francisco specifically, is absolutely just saturated in, in moisture. 
Um, we have, we're in a huge drought, right, in California, and yet this area is, is basically like this every day. Um, and it's a kind of really fantastic sort of um, environment. Um, and it, we're on the water, we have all of this kind of post-industrial um, residue in the neighborhood, um, lots of old Navy ships that are kind of contaminated, lots of different kind of things. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty inspiring uh, environment. And yet due to kind of global climate change, the, the edge of San Francisco um, Bay um, is indeed is, 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 is being questioned, right? Because uh, things like the airport, in, in fact, the entire um, eastern side of San Francisco is in completely landfill, including the, you know, where our office is. Um, and so the, a lot of people are really curious about what's gonna happen. Um, there's an Army Corps of Engineer plan to basically build a really big wall around San Francisco eventually. Um, and we were, we were prompted by uh, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art for a show that they were doing to actually look specifically at the edge um, I think they were just tired tired of us hearing us complain about things, and they said, okay, well, what would you do? Um, and so um, we sort of attacked this edge. This is the, this is the bay. It's a, it's a highly, it's a kind of a concrete nightmare, um, but it does, does well right now. It holds back the water. But if you're there on a, on a kind of stormy day, quite literally the waves are washing up over the Embarcadera uh, as we speak. But there's a kind of climate denial, even in San Francisco, there's really not a, I would say a, a really active plan for this. So we began to kind of think about it, think about what kind of ecologies could happen if we basically um, allowed some of this uh, water to begin to kind of infiltrate. We developed this idea called you know, the Hydromax proposals. So we actually took on the edge of the bay, let the, the seawater rise, and invented this entirely new kind of building typology that was all about maximizing its um, um, a kind of relationship with, with water. Um, and so these are these kind of um, these fingers, these new fingers that would extend out into the bay um, that would have um, agricultural kind of elements um, in them, aquaponics, and then a kind of a, a kind of a water gathering, active water gathering device on the on the roof. And this is a sort of the section of this thing. Um, really, the theater of lost species um, has a home here. Um, this is the Hydromax and the, the next project I'll show, which is back here. Hydrospan, we basically did a trilogy of projects all sort of happening in the same um, kind of areas. Without getting into too much detail, we're sort of playing through how the, how the building will be active and how the building will be a kind of communal space and how the bay, the, the edge of the bay, we see it as a kind of a space for experimentation, for growing things, for making things, not as a kind of, um, a kind of, a, a kind of mono, monolithic space, but something that could be active again. Um, and so we sort of played through all of the kind of things, looked at what would happen if we could make it this kind of, you know, totally zany environment. And to give the students an idea, when, when you get a commission like this from a museum like SFMOMA, they come to you, you have literally four weeks uh, before, you know, they give you the prompt and you have to produce the piece in four weeks. All of the drawings, all the models, the whole proposal. So if these are cartoony, I, I totally get that, but they're, um, for me, again, we're, we're still embedding many ideas about kind of production. This was right around the time when um, Solyndra, uh, which was this kind of a, a, a solar company, uh, basically went bankrupt and they basically sold all of their KUKA robots uh, to China and to other places. And we said, well, what the hell are you doing that for? We, we'll take them here and we'll use them to, um, to make things and to cultivate things and be kind of farmers again. Um, for, so as a part of the show, we built, the, we built a physical model um, we were very interested in, in, again, making this 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 model live. You know, getting people to begin to look at this this kind of architecture as something that's actually um, you know having this kind of reciprocity, let's say, with its with its environment. So we began to thread shape memory al memory alloys and, and kind of sensors into the model. Um, this is the model in our in our former um, office space. Um, this is just sort of some of the prototyping that we do. Rapid prototyping, four week project, design build, drop it in a museum in four weeks. Um, doing all of our own kind of uh, circuit boarding and all of this um, kind of stuff. And this is just a very quick um, video that shows you what the, what the model can do. The idea was that these fog catching feathers would, would move up you know, kind of into the sky. So in that, that kind of critical moment between say 3 a.m. And, and 6 a.m. When, when you have this kind of totally saturated um, environment with, with, uh, with fog, these would move up into the sky and, and condense water, and you, you basically would use that water the rest of the day, and they would collect solar energy you know, during the day. And so um, it was just a way to kind of get the idea across. This entire model, as you can see, um, you know, we sort of built it with no glue. It's totally notched together, hand-sewn together, 
it's a kind of obsessive, almost textile um, exploration in a kind of a soft architecture, even though it's made out of acrylic. Um, but we felt it was important to, to kind of do that. Um, and you can see that kind of that kind of landscape below it, that kind of control landscape with the sensors and and all the electronics. We kind of exposed that explicitly for our, our students. Um, we always hate it when we go to go to shows and things get hidden. So we actually literally had this kind of secret um, compartment where people that wanted to understand how things are working could get in and and really understand it. Um, and then we were we were prompted to to do the next project um, about a year later uh, for a different museum. Um, and so we, we looked at um, the, the, the kind of neighboring Bay Bridge. Um, anyone that's been in San Francisco recently knows that the kind of the, the western span of the bridge has been uh, basically dismantled and decommissioned. Um, they put this really sort of uh, uh, lame kind of cable kind of state bridge in its place. So it's, it's up, up for grabs what's going to actually happen to the western um, span. This is a really gorgeous, massive uh, bridge it connects um, San Francisco to Oakland and really interconnects the Bay Area, um, and so it's this kind of kind of ripe condition. Um, and what I love about this project is it, is it uh, this project this this infrastructure this 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 bridge. Um, you know, it was built in the 30s. It was built in an, in a couple of years. Um, can you imagine that in the 1930s building this in in a couple of years with horse drawn carriages, um, with with you know literally people living up on top of the of the um, trusses living there for weeks on end i mean unbelievable what went into this but it really got us thinking about what would, what would it be like to be there um and at the same time of course i'm, I'm sort of obsessed with william gibson i'm a you know big reader of of, of science fiction and, and uh, such things and he's got a, this amazing book i recommend it called a virtual light which is in, it's entirely set you know in this climate um, it's all about virtual reality, but it's all set within the kind of um, the, the Bay Bridge. And at the same time, you have these these sort of folks in Silicon Valley um, who are, are really calling for a kind of, you know, they, they want to, in a way, secede from America. There's too many regula. I mean, California doesn't have a lot of regulations, let's say, compared to a lot of places. But there's a, there's this subgroup um, that I'm kind of involved with who who are very much about kind of seceding. Um, these, are, these are folks that are going to Burning Man every year. These are folks that are going out to small islands off the coast um, on the weekends um, to, li you know, to literally build a new kind of Silicon Valley that's sort of free of the constraints. And other folks that are um, you know, in, very interested in things like Bitcoin and the kind of, the, the kind of um, agenda that goes along with that. Um, and then, of course, you have this spectacular um, sort of thing that's about to be abandoned in about 15 or, or 20 years. And so what do we begin to kind of do with it? Um, the other thing I, I put in here today is, is um, you know, I mean, this is a sort of an honest um, slide, um, um, maybe a post-graduation slide for you guys. Um, I, I still, when I read, I draw. So when I, when I actually read William Gibson, I keep a sketchbook beside me and I actually literally try and figure out what he's talking about. And I draw stuff out. And I, and I think it's, um, for me, um, important to sort of share this because I think it's a, it's, a, it's a way of actually working. Thinking through sort of ideas, through sketching, um, is to be honest with you, somehow what, I, what I'm still interested in doing and I, th and I still think it's got kind of a place here. Um, this is this kind of insane world, this new ecology, literally taking a program that was written by people like Larry Page, um, who are super interested in the, these kinds of worlds. What would it be? Well, it'd need to be autonomous. You'd need to be able to grow your own, you know, kind of plants. You'd have your own animals there. You'd, you'd, you'd have um, service robots. You'd have a whole sort of world there. Um, and so we began to kind of draw out this world for this group. Um, and, and suspended it quite literally from the, the Bay Bridge. We were looking at capturing and holding water. So there's this huge kind of interest in kind of water um, catching kind of um, baffles, um, bladders, um, say. And so the entire model is sort of made up out of these things. Very much interested in this kind of encampment. Um, this would be a group, it would be an exceptional group that might live there and kind of colonize the bridge. Um, live there with their family in this kind of new alternative, um, you know, um, kind of place. And so we had the opportunity to build a, a large scale model of this proposal. And this is a, again in this um, kind of museum. And um, this is one of the reasons I, uh, I titled the talk with the, the word utopia. The first time I was at the show, 
there was a woman that was there and she, she, she was French and she was just saying, utopia, utopia, utopia. And she just wouldn't you know, shut up about utopia and, and, and sort of talk to her. And it was, it was just really interesting um, about the kind of take. And I think a lot of people had that kind of notion about it, especially when you walked into this room, this room was cantilevered off um, um, over a street and it, it really was a liminal kind of space. We really tried to kind of highlight these different qualities. Half of the space, we blocked the light out um, and made this kind of hyper, as if it was in a kind of a nighttime, this glowing um, kind of space. Um, these are these are um, little um, sort of transportation pods that we would be lowered from the um, hydrospan down into the water. We would be fishing, um, you know, and, and transporting people and kind of goods um, up and down. These are these sort of um, these 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 places for people to live, encampments, um, and you can kind of understand the kind of intermixing of things um, within the robot. We 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 sort of developed this idea of uh, this kind of wild species that might live there. And many of the drawings were sort of associating these species that were sort of hybrids. They were like cybernetic um, wolves and other species that might begin to live there and kind of prowl the night and perhaps they, they get eaten or they become kind of co-predators co, um, with the humans. Um, so we just really began to kind of play out these scenarios and kind of built the, built the, built the narrative. Um, and I think our practice is sort of driven this, this way. We, we really oscillate back and forth between hyper technological or hyper sort of small scale things that are real um, to, to sort of large sort of visions. Uh, some might say, uh, I hate to say it myself, but almost a megalomaniacal say, grand you know, total visions for, for a potential world. Um, but for me, I, I th I, it's, it's a really important um, outlet, let's say. Um, and then this is a view um, from the street of these, of these sort of um, ribbons um, and, 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 and really I think um, that project in a lot of ways, even though it is a kind of, for us, a design model, set, sets up another, another thing to kind of mention is the experience of, let's say, moving through this space um, with these elements. In a way, it was sort of scaleless. I mean, it, actually, many people were sort of in there, and they didn't even look and see the, the little human figures on the model. It became a, a spatial just experiment um, of kind of light, um, and the LEDs were sort of responsive to the, to the environment. Um, so that same museum um, commissioned us uh, very recently. Again, um, this uh, commission um, involved three months and $30,000, okay? Um, and a, and a hundred and twenty foot long facade, um, and so um, we had previously been shortlisted for a project at the Henry Art Museum um, in Seattle as a James Terrell piece on the left to do a to do a piece in their facade. Um, I'll be the first to say that I think they kind of wimped out. They they picked a very safe piece. We built a kinetic um, interface that would sit between basically the museum, the outside of the museum and the inside of the museum, that as you basically moved up to the, this facade, the piece would open up and allow you to, to sort of see into the, into the, into the piece, um, see into the museum, very much like a, sw a swarm-like kind of behavior. Um, and so we built, a, we built a kind of prototype of this um, in, our, in our lab and um, made a kind of kinetic uh, module. Um, we were really excited about it, and we did not get the, the final commission, but we sort of, um, a year later, uh, began to really think fundamentally about re redoing this piece and revisiting it. So being sort of still relatively young and foolish um, and kind of cavalier, we decided to kind of, con con kind of take this idea and apply it to this, um, this uh, uh, Maki uh, facade at the Yerba Buena Center. So we were basically given the facade as a kind of site um, and we were given literally um, 10 inches um, of depth um, to build something and, and $30,000 and not a lot of time. Um, and this is its context, that's SF MoMA that's sitting behind it. Um, it's a really active kind of place, it's a very urban place. It's a, it's a pass through in the city. Many people pass by it um, and, and eat lunch in front of it and it's a very active kind of location. Um, so these are just some of the, as an example, some of the pieces that we showed the museum um, to kind of get the job, things that we actually look, look, are looking at and reading about and things that we're kind of obsessed with. Um, and of course, you guys understand all of these things. And the, the, the third item at the bottom was something that took a little bit more convincing, um, this idea of kind of swarm dynamics and how could, you know, in our original proposal, um, it was in motion, right? And so 
we were actually really interested in having this kind of autonomous swarm sitting behind the scenes that would actually, you, you would essentially come to you um, as if you were in front of the facade and would begin to kind of open up those, those apertures. So we started to look at how that might begin to operate in, in a kind of facade like this. Um, so we quite literally have a, a virtual model, uh, 3D model, um, that is, um, we're actually running this in processing, that is quite literally a three-dimensional space where a swarm um, is moving in and out of the facade in real time. So we're running actually a simulation behind the scenes, um, which is feeding um, feeding our our, our piece. Um, it's it's um, attracted to sound, so we essentially wired up the entire facade with um, vibration sensors. So we put little vibration sensors on every pane of glass in the facade and turn the facade into literally a kind of a sensing device for the city. And all it's really doing is it's just searching out the loudest. Um, the most vibration in its environment, and then it's sending this virtual swarm over there to 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 basically um, have a relationship, have a kind of uh, a kind of a, a feedback with you. And these are just some really early um, kind of concept sketches, but how that how that swarm might begin to kind of negotiate uh, the physical environment, especially if you had um, you know two two sort of similar sounds, could the swarm begin to kind of divide? Um, and really, the idea was to create a kind of environment where the the light the light would literally kind of hover around you. And if you, if you grew silent, if you stopped kind of speaking to it if, it, if if it didn't know you were there anymore, it would actually move on. It would find another um, thing to, to sort of serve, say. Um, and so for us, that was a kind of driver behind this, the kind of behavior of, of the swarm. Um, um, and, and more practically, um, you know, more or less just for the students to sort of think about this, there's, there's, there's something like 500 units entirely 3D printed. Um, of course, we 3D printed it. We had all that time, all that money. Um, but we 3D printed it, suspended these sort of frames. Um, you can see the frame on the right from the kind of window frames. Um, these are just LED holders, um, some prototyping of the, of the LED drivers. The kind of um, the kind of the the, the kind of nodes, um, wireless communication, um, all sorts of things, built frames. Um, this is our our new studio space um, where we're kind of prototyping um, kind of everything. This is the this is the um, space that we actually created. It was actually really fascinating having all of these frames kind of in the space, reacting and actually interacting with them in a in a in a context that wasn't the museum. For me, it was the most fascinating thing because it was still a swarm, it was still operating, but it was actually three-dimensional. It was this, this kind of incredible environment. I think our next um, installation piece will be much more kind of a, kind of a spatial version of this. Um, and this is just a very, very quick video. Um, um, it kind of gets at some of these ideas. And we did this video as a part of the, of course we agreed to do a video as a part of it, you know, with all the money we had. Um, but the idea of the video is to communicate to a broader audience, not an architectural audience, uh, say, what the, what the ideas of the, of the piece were. So it's a very quickly produced thing. But really, in a lot of ways, what we're trying to get the point across is that the city is, is sort of latent with lots of, of data. Um, and how do we actually make it visible? How do we make it kind of legible? And how do we make that data begin to kind of have a relationship with the, the users of this, of this building? Um, I haven't actually watched this video for, for a while. So you see the, the, the kind of the, the setup, um, very similar to what many of you guys are thinking about. Um, but it's really about that kind of communication. So this, these people are actually standing outside of the facade. If you stand outside of it, you literally just clap or you have a conversation. The light swarm will literally come to you. Um, these, are the, these are the sensors, They're very, very simple. Vibration sensors that are attached with some, some VHB onto the, onto the glass. Um, and then this is the sort of algorithm that's running uh, the kind of processing sketch that's running behind the scenes, and that's kind of feeding this uh, uh, this facade. So you can see.
see this person is literally just you know going up trying to trigger it. and that's what I, what's actually really fun is that you see people throughout the day um, we have a drop cam on the on the installation um, you actually see people during the day actually coming clapping talking to it yelling at it conversing with the with the piece and it's, it's, it's this totally new way to think about I'd say um, an architecture that people are really I would almost say emotionally sort of drawn to this thing and get almost upset when it doesn't kind of react to them say uh, and I find that to be a really um, interesting behavior um, let's say um, and then this is just a, this is one of the clearest versions of this this is a I just literally captured this on our drop can this is an employee so it's, it's fine if I show this to you and he's I mean he's just literally there hanging out and it wasn't responding to him so he's gonna I think he's gonna clap here and you can see the swarm really visibly kind of coming um, towards him and what's fun about this if you look in the bottom left you'll see a, a bicycle um, kind of bicyclist riding by. This is very early in the morning. I think it's like seven in the morning or something. Bicyclist comes by and the swarm actually abandons him and goes down and, and was attracted to the, um, to, the, to the bicyclist going by. So that kind of, a, you know, kind of feedback, I think, for very interesting. And again, I think, you know, back to practice a little bit, this is the reality of kind of pulling a practice, to, uh, you know, kind of project together the kind of all of the different pieces that, that kind of come and the kind of planning, the logistics of, of actually um, doing this and the, and the kind of budget. And, and then really for me, this was, this was the, what, what we were after. We were after trying to get as many people to the facade, as many people trying to kind of have a kind of relationship with it. Um, and, and I think we really kind of accomplished the, the goal. Um, the last sort of a maybe formal project I'll show is, is called Data Grove. Um, Data Group was a commission by this really interesting group called Zero One. They're based in San Jose. Um, San Jose is the kind of um, kind of the epicenter of Silicon Valley, um, and their prompting was seeking Silicon Valley. So if you're looking for Silicon Valley, where do you find it? Um, I've had groups of students come from the AA and all over the place. Friends, relatives come to visit us in San Francisco, and of course they all say, Jason, "Jason, you know, bring me to Google, uh, bring me to you know HP. I want to see Silicon Valley, right? Because it's just a really amazing place." Fact is, it's not. You know, it's there's, it's not that amazing. I mean, there's nothing there. More, most of the time, you you do this. You, you see people taking their photograph in front of the sign, but it's mostly impenetrable. You know, really, it's not set up for people to really go see it because it's highly secretive, right? It's highly kind of, um, kind of embedded. And so as a prompting for this kind, of, um, this kind of arts festival, we were like really interested in seeking Silicon Valley. Where can we find it? Um, and you know, we started to look at these maps. Um, everyone probably these days knows that when you tweet something, um, your tweet is actually geolocated, okay? And so we started to understand a little bit about um, geographically, what people were tweeting, what they were thinking about, what was on their mind, what was buzzing geographically. And in San Francisco, I don't remember when this was, but Obama, Cyprus, Israel, Korea, these are just things that were, were kind of trending. And then in the heart of Silicon Valley, you got, you got lots of you know, somewhat interesting things. Um, you know, sometimes it's totally rubbish, right? Sometimes it's Justin Bieber. Um, a lot of the times it's, you know, um, it's, it's stuff that you just really don't care about. Other times it's sort of strange and unknown and, and slightly profound. So what we started to do is write really, um, really um, small little programs that would essentially go in and scrape this data off the internet. And we would write it to our datagrove.net um, kind of server. And then we, we basically created an installation that could access um, those, those data points. So in this case, Wisconsin, Israel, playing and, and Easter. Um, and we, we decided to make a kind of a, a space, let's say, a space for um, social media, a space where um, Twitter feeds or things that we're actually normally doing with our cell phone actually had a kind of an outlet, say. Um, and we built this right in the, the kind of belly of, of San Jose. Um, and we were really intrigued with things because, you know, sometimes it's like war, love, money, beauty, sex, it's a lot of sex, infinity, technology, et cetera. Um, and we, we decided to make this kind of lattice work that would really kind of hold um, this data. So again, the kind of prototyping process, which is super familiar to you guys. How do you kind of hold these things? How do you make a kind of container for these guys? Um, how do you kind of construct this um, and make it spatial um, and make it, a, make it a place? And so these are just some, some images of the, the different pieces of this puzzle. Very similar to running around the, the DRL yesterday, seeing the amazing prototypes everywhere. I mean, this is literally what we're, we're kind of up to in our studio space. And then this is the final piece. Um, 
this is made out of, again, the budget for this was, um, I think, um, $16,000. Um, we built a really large piece um, on a very, very slim budget. And the way we did that is we used common materials that you can get at almost any electrical supply shop. This is literally conduit, um, electrical conduit, um, acrylic tubing, um, very, very inexpensive LEDs. So we were able to kind of put this thing together on a shoestring and make a, a substantial space out of virtually nothing. This all fit into a very small van, which is also an important kind of criteria. Um, and the, the whole idea was to suspend these five um, kind of media pods um, that basically um, whispered to you. So we used a, um, a text-to-speech synthesizer that would basically take the Twitter feed and convert it to, a, to, a, to speech. Um, and so the wall actually whispered to you. Architecture literally talked to you. Um, and um, as you walked by the, walked by the piece, it would whisper these little things to you. So we, we would add text to it. It would say, have you heard the rumor about, I don't know, Michelle Obama or whatever? You know, have, um, did you hear the one about um, Greece, right? Um, the election or something. And so we added some text and people would literally, quite literally thought that the architecture had a, had a degree of intelligence about it. Even though we were doing some very, very simple um, gestures, um, they, they really thought it was intelligent, even though it really was not. Have you heard about data growth by Future Cities Lab? There's a rumor about NASA Curiosity. Everybody's talking about the United Nations. Have you heard about Silicon Valley? Have you heard about X Factor? So the, the pods were basically amplifiers. The, the kind of the shape of it literally was a speaker facing backwards, so it would amplify the sound out towards you. Have you heard about Silicon Valley? People are actually discovering things about the city that they didn't know. Um, they would take their phones out, they'd have a conversation with their neighbors asking about something that was actually occurring kind of in real time. And this is really what we were after, is to have that kind of feedback. You'd actually learn something from this kind of speaking architecture and it would actually inform you and would become a kind of a social space, a gathering space, almost like a kind of an urban uh, water, uh, water cooler or something like that, where you'd actually begin to understand um, data. I'm gonna shift a little bit. I, I um, thought it'd be interesting to show a little bit of the work. I'm also, as Theo mentioned, uh, a teacher. I teach, um, Natalie and I both teach at CCA. Uh, we teach at Cornell. We teach at other um, institutions. Um, but I thought I'd show you really specifically a, um, a, a course that I started teaching two years ago, which has some, maybe some resonance with, with some of the, the work. So maybe some of the students will be interested in this. And this is a rapid fire work. And again, this isn't a, 16 uh, months, this is actually a course where the, the students are building um, what I call creative architecture machines. Um, rapid fire, these are eight week projects. Um, and a part of this, um, and I'll just sort of jump, part of the provocation um, from, from our perspective was to really interrogate what's actually happening in, in kind of the design studio or in a design office. Um, and of course, you know, John touched on some of this last night. But you know, why really from 1963 to 93 or 2003 or, or to today, are we not fundamentally questioning how we're designing buildings? The average architect um, who's not doing scripting and, and other fancy things is quite literally still pointing a, a mouse in a very typical fashion and kind of drawing. Um, and so the, this, the workspace of the architect has not fundamentally, um, let's say, changed or adapted. And so this is a part of the prompting of creative architecture machines is to sort of interrogate that. The other thing we're trying to interrogate is, is very much symptomatic of what you see around you. Are these kinds of spaces, your school has one, our school has one, everyone has one. You know, the universal laser cutter, the CNC mill, the, the kind of stock um, 3D printing uh, kind of setup. Um, and, and why is that? Why are, we, why are we happy with that? Why are we not actually you know, re inventing new radical tools and kind of, uh, kind of rethinking this um, entirely? Um, other, other prompts are, are just thinking through the relationship between um, academia and professional culture. You know, this is Kent State. This is an architecture office. Um, 
um, in, in California, in the, in, or, I'm sorry, in Texas in the 1970s, and the kind of interplay, the setup between kind of school, academia, and, and when you, you get out, go out into the professional environment. I'm actually really intrigued with folks that are, are, are leaving um, DRL. You know, how are you guys gonna actually set up your professional environment? Is it gonna look like, you know, the environment on the right, will you be happy there? No, you're gonna want all the stuff you've got here. You're probably gonna wanna sit your desk up on top of a, of a CNC mill. You're gonna wanna actually, you know, build a, a 3D printer that's the size of your office and actually work in it, right? You're not gonna be satisfied, you know, sitting at a desk. Look, look at the fantastic setup that you have. And a part of this is just for us, you know, at CCA, it's, it's the, CCA is actually the youngest school of architecture in the US. We started a, a graduate program um, four, year, four years ago. And part of this is actually for us looking at our space of production, our lab, our lab life, say, um, and actually beginning to kind of forecast what that might set these people up uh, for. Um, a lot of people are coming to our school, not necessarily thinking that they want to go into a kind of professional, traditional design practice. They're going to be hybrid practitioners um, working for themselves or working for all sorts of different people. So as a part of this kind of course, we, we, we have the students build very, very quick rapid fire kind of drawing machines. This is just an example of it. We build 2D machines that, that are reacting to um, environmental inputs, things like sunlight or sound. And this is a very quick, like two week kind of exercise. And I, I can imagine many of you had to go through this as a kind of, um, kind of shotgun wedding in the very beginning. And this is very much what we're kind of starting with. And it, it allows them to do something two dimensionally, um, attaching some, some pens, you know, building a kind of auto, automatic, say, drawing machine, generative drawing machine. And then we actually start to get them into three dimensions, begin to build up their knowledge set in, with, with software. Um, as I mentioned, I'm also uh, co-developing this software called Firefly. All of the students are actually using the software and actually feeding information back into the kind of evolution of the software. But this is a kind of very typical setup. This is a this is a Delta bot robot that the students made from scratch on the right. Um, and then this is the software environment that's literally controlling this um, 3D printer in, in real time. Um, so we can actually embed sensor input into it, it's, it's printing clay in this, in this um, version. Um, this is just a quick video of this. Um, and it's sort of, for me, it, um, sort of interesting. Not that I'd say that the project is, is um, anything, anything radical. I mean, the Delta bot as a kind of a, um, as a kind of a technology is, is pretty tried and true. Um, what was interesting though for these guys was actually quite literally um, building the software for this from scratch, building the hardware, doing all of the programming. Um, and again, a very kind of rapid um, kind of fire you know, kind of period. And then actually building, um, building, using the machine itself to build something that they would not have been able to build had they not you know, kind of created the machine. Um, and all of the kind of material studies that all of you guys have all had to do, these guys are doing them in a kind of super abbreviated fashion. Um, and then when we get to this um, sort of setup, and this for me is one of the most interesting parts is that they're having to innovate um, on the kind of software side, build virtual models of the machine, get, get real time kind of feedback uh, from those machines, um, and then have them you know, exhibit a kind of degree of, uh, of kind of control, but then begin to kind of hack them, attach sensors to them, begin to kind of do something that's less linear. Um, and, for, and for me, I think it's a, it's a kind of a very interesting moment. We saw that in many of the projects where if you build a machine like this, you control it with absolute precision, um, you'll be bored of it in a, in a matter of weeks. What became super interesting for, for these guys was to start to look much more carefully at the things that they thought were initially failures. So in this case, this is the sort of graveyard of failures. But, you know, they got so frustrated that at every, literally every review, the reviewers were not picking up the really precise ones. They were picking up the, the gnarly, monstrous you know, pieces that had all this potential kind of embedded in it. Um, other projects, um, very, you know, obviously in our office, we're doing a lot of autonomous um, kind of rover projects. Um, this is a piece uh, from just a few months ago where students are building a kind of self-aware, um, context-aware 3D printer um, kind of uh, platform. Um, and this is, a, a, again, a kind of a rover pod. It's actually printing these, um, these um, I don't know, they were kind of domestic dwellings, I guess they were calling them, um, in situ. Um, and anyone that's been in this, working in this space knows the complexity of actually understanding where something is in 3D space doing it with a degree of precision. These guys are actually 3D printing with uh, an available material at the School of Architecture, which was free. 
um, we have this big dumpster of, of sawdust out back and they literally were pillaging the sawdust and actually bringing that into studio made a bloody mess, but it was amazing to see. Um, and literally we're 3D printing these kind of, um, these kind of um, encampments, say, um, out of, out of, um, out of uh, sawdust. And these are just sort of um, things that we get into the different ecosystem, um, the idea of a spreader, a kind of a fixer and an excavator, this kind of ecology, this robotic ecology that begins to kind of um, happen and, um, and um, all the different things that go with it. Um, another project that had sort of resonance with some of the things we saw yesterday and today was these students were built, I mean, literally a kind of a, a, kind of a robotic um, um, you know, weaving machine from scratch, programmed it from scratch, you know, coded it from scratch, um, and I thought that was interesting. Um, and then other folks, this is a, um, this is a, a, a robot that actually drills holes um, and then secretes um, biomaterial into the holes. And so it's a, it's a bioremediation robot that gets dropped with drones. We did a drone, bunch of drone drops. So this thing actually gets picked up by a drone, gets dropped on a, on a um, super fun site operates on super fun sites um, and then gets gets droned away and you can see some of the artifacts in the upper right uh, very simple um, pumps that many of your you guys are all using here um, and then just other kind of rogue projects what I love about this is that there's no um, I mean quite literally the guy on the right is holding a, a kettle that he bought in Chinatown um, and he incorporated it into the into this underwater um, wax printer so the students are actually printing in this case um, underwater um, uh, um, um, kind of uh, um, kind of forms, and this is just some some views of that. It's a it's a platform that gets lowered. In, it's printing literally on the surface of the water. It gets lowered into the water, um, and so they're building these these kinds of machines. These are these new um, radical forms. I think I think um, what I what I love about this is that there's this kind of idealized computer model that exists of this this guide. Um, which is literally giving kind of G code. And then there's the kind of reality of actually printing on the surface of water, which gives you these totally fantastic things that, that, that were hard to, to predict. Um, and then other, other folks, um, uh, these guys were very much interested in spiders, uh, I'm sorry, snakes, and they, they built an incredible set of um, snake models and, um, and, and built this um, essentially a kind of a snake bot um, 3D printer. It was a, a, a kind of a subtractive printer. They're literally dripping a kind of acid on the foam, and then they were casting plaster into the foam as a secondary process, a kind of human process. Um, but a very, you know, very simple um, set of mechanisms um, that yielded, you know, all of these different things that they were essentially casting. Um, and again, this is very similar to what's happening here. You know, this is these are eight-week projects. These students had absolutely no background in, in um, you know, machine building, computation, software. Most of them didn't even know. Uh, how to use this stuff, and and um, and they get they get pretty far and do some pretty some pretty interesting things. These are just other artifacts from that production. The other thing I want to talk about is the the, the sort of the I and mean, I'm super excited. I didn't really understand this Theo's uh, other people's descriptions of the kind of sharing culture that goes on here between the years and um, this kind of database that the DRL has kind of established. I've done a kind of a different version of that, um, and I'd encourage you guys to check this out. Um, we've completely open sourced, we actually asked the students if they take the studio, that they basically agree to open source the projects. So what that actually means is that they, they agree to release all of the code, all of the laser cut files, the 3D printer files, everything um, um, online. And we've established a, a relationship with um, Instructables which is a really amazing uh, company. It was you know, bought by Autodesk, but it's still doing some pretty amazing things. Um, and they've actually sponsored us and, and done some pretty awesome stuff with it. So my students are actually, and I'll just, I'm gonna click on here just to give you a sense of these things. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention here is, if I can pause that. So this is, this is an instructable. Um, it's, a, it's a medium to share both images, descriptions, and files. Um, and also, it's a, there's a forum on the website. Um, this was, I, I did this video maybe a year ago. This is maybe a few months after it was published. It had 30,000 hits um, within, I think, three weeks of being published. Um, and what, what's, for me, incredible about that is that we have students now contacting us quite literally from all over the world, not within architecture necessarily, but from all these allied disciplines. And if you look at the forum for this, my students are now communicating um, and making connections with people all over the world and in totally different kind of disciplines. And they, they take this actually very seriously. 
Um, and so do I. In fact, they, they obviously they have to do it to get a grade. Um, and then you, as we kind of scroll down here, you'll see, I mean, it's very, very detailed. Um, and 3D printer files, all of the kind of the code, um, all of the kind of bits and pieces that go into kind of making one of these complex assemblies. Now, what, what I found to be really intriguing about this is that is what this actually has set up for the next crop of, of students going through is, is um, they aren't starting from scratch, right? They're actually really actively looking at this. Um, they're communicating by email and, and actually having visitors come through from previous years and it's created a kind of a, a really amazing network. And it's just something to, to really begin to kind of think about. Um, I was actually sort of in the beginning skeptical of sharing it kind of outside of CCA because I thought, oh, and it's gonna be kind of embedded knowledge and it's gonna be sort of, you know, do I really want people all over the world really you know, doing this? But it's actually worked out really well, I'd say, um, because it's, amp it, it, it's amplified really the next phase of the group. Um, and just so, sort of to, to, to crack open the, the, the process here a little bit. Um, and we, we saw, I would love seeing today some of the early study models that the students were doing. And, and I'm, I'm really excited that the students in, in this studio were, were literally starting with um, foam core, um, um, you know, rubber bands, um, just really basic kind of prototyping materials. Again, no knowledge whatsoever of how to do these things. And then this is, again, the very, very beginnings of just starting to learn how these things work. Very clumsy, very heavy. They fell over. Um, and again, we, I talked yesterday about the, the, the capacity of a lot of these, these kind of robotic things. In the beginning, you know, I think really they are going to fall over. They'll be like a, they'll be like a six month old kid, right? They won't have, um, you know, knowledge of the world. And that's so much of what happens in the kind of early phases of these things. Uh, this is some of their earliest experiments um, where they were beginning to try and understand how they can make a mobile 3D printing platform. So a hexapod robot that would literally go out in the world and begin to kind of 3D print um, its environment. Um, some early stages um, of, of kind of printing with precision, trying to print loops, print lines, et cetera, in its environment. Um, different geometric figures, and you know you can see the you can see printed on these little black sheets the idealized figure of what the of what the code was was telling the robot, and then you can see the the actual print um, on the on the environment, and just hundreds of these crazy things, um, and then beginning to kind of gain a degree of of kind of control. And I'll, this will be the last little piece I'll, I'll play here. Um, this is two undergrads, so these are probably twenty year old kids and one one grad student. Um, eight weeks. So the, the issue of gait, I mean the issue of, of motion and gait is a, is a really large one and I think to, to get it to move in, in a kind of coordinated fashion obviously takes a lot of work um, and, and having this um, kind of software environment where you're actually literally able to in real time begin to kind of tweak the code and actually see and simulate that gait um, and then actually begin to you know, kind of transpose it to the robot um, is super valuable. So you're seeing here the kind of Firefly environment. Um, the really, really basic computer model it doesn't need to be a solid model. It can just be a, literally a, a point and a kind of line model. Um, the kind of translation effects of geometry. In this case, for, at this point in the project, they were quite literally just using a kind of a um, hot glue gun as their kind of uh, printer head material. Different gates that would, adjust, would basically adapt to different uh, kind of landscape terrains trying to simulate um, getting some algorithms and, and simulating different animals um, on, the, on the hexapod. And then all of the innovation which you begin to see, the, the, kind, of, uh, the kind of evolution of the, the end of this, the adding of a kind of a rubber pad uh, with a roller on it actually kind of allowed this thing to literally quite, quite literally walk in the world. The beginnings of thinking about machine vision. We've got an embedded kind of machine vision system in here. So the, the, the robot is kind of self-aware. Um, in the case of this, we're using a fiducial marker. Um, so you'll see, it's not on this one, but you'll see on another one. It's a little symbol that you put on top of the robot and it, it actually can, uh, it knows where it is in, in physical space. And 
just kind of generations of these things, improvements you know, evolving itself um, in, in a really fascinating kind of fashion. And a lot of this stuff, you know, is, is sort of a, a sort of a last minute. Um, prompting by me to begin to get them to think about how this might begin to kind of have an influence on a landscape. You know, scale is a little bit unclear, but how, how could you begin to think of this as being um, something that's territorial and having a larger kind of um, influence? And I think that's the, that's the last slide. I want to thank you, Theo, for the opportunity to, to share all this stuff. And it's been an amazing day. I'm sure you guys are exhausted. I'm exhausted. But uh, thank you. And I'm happy to take questions if, if uh, or we can just do it informally. If there's something super urgent, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise uh, Destructibles and an email Jason is available online. Anything super quick? I know that I'm not sort of making it so accessible. That's probably because we're two hours late to a dinner reservation and some of us need to eat. Is that cool? Cool. Thank you so much.